Luke chapter 22, and I'm going to begin reading with verse number 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And notice this, he said unto them, with desire, everybody say with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. It was not the first Passover that Jesus had eaten with his disciples, but it was this Passover that he had looked forward to with desire. Because this Passover was the final Passover. This Passover was the one that would signify the change from the dispensation of law to the dispensation of grace. This Passover was the one just before the blood would be spilled for the salvation of the world. With desire... I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. By the help of the Lord today, I want to preach to you God's greatest desire. God's greatest desire. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this service. We thank you for this place. We thank you for these people. And God, I thank you for what you desire to do in this house today. I thank you for what you are going to do among us as we surrender our minds and our spirits unto you, as we receive the word of God into our spirit. Lord, I pray that you would anoint the ears that hear as well as the voice that speaks and help us, O oh God, to mix your word with faith that we might grow thereby. We give you praise and glory. We magnify you in the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. amen. And you may be seated in the name of the Lord. God's greatest desire. We don't often think about God experiencing or having the same type of emotion that we as human beings have. We sometimes separate the divine from the natural, and we don't really understand sometimes how God looks upon us or how He views us as His creation. The Bible does tell us that we are created in the image of God. And in fact, if you read the Scripture carefully, you will find that God is love, which is an emotion, but He also experiences and expresses other emotions. There are times when God expresses the emotion of hate. There are times when He expresses the emotion of jealousy. There are times when God makes Himself almost vulnerable, if you will, in his emotional expression. And so it is imperative that we understand that God is consumed with a great desire and that we understand what 
that desire is and who that desire is toward. When we look in the beginning of time as we know it to the creation, we can see that all that was created was created with a specific purpose. When you think about the fact that the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Bible said the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the waters and God said, let there be light. Now why is it that God would create light? He didn't need light, for He is light. So God didn't create light for Himself. There must have been another purpose in mind for Him calling light into existence. As you follow the plan of creation from day to day, we see that God divided the waters above from the waters beneath and created an atmosphere. Not because He needed an atmosphere, but because He was pointing toward the purpose of His creation. God caused the dry land to appear. He divided the land from the waters and collected the waters all in one place and caused the dry land to come forth and then the plants upon the land and the animals that He created and all that He did, the sun and the moon and the stars, it was not because God needed those things, but it was because on the crowning day of creation, He was going to form and fashion a man out of the dust of the earth and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life, and that man would become a living soul. All that God created was for man. It was for Adam and eventually Eve who would be taken from his side and fashioned into a helpmeet for him. It was for them that God created all that was created. And we begin to see an expression of God's greatest desire. After the creation, He planted a garden eastward in Eden and put the man and the woman in the garden to dress it and to keep it. Uh, He had prepared it specifically for them. And then the Bible tells us that God came every day in the cool of the day and walked with them and communed with them and talked with them. And we get another glimpse of God's greatest desire in the Garden of Eden. But tragically, sin entered in as Eve was tempted and then she took the temptation to Adam and together they ate of the forbidden forbidden fruit, and suddenly their communion with God was broken. But I have a question for you. God had told them that in the day they would eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would surely die. But they didn't die. Oh, they began to die, of course as they were separated from the tree of life, and they died spiritually, no question about that. But why is it that God didn't destroy them at the moment they ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? He had said to them, in the day you eat of it, you will die. But I contend there was something beating within the bosom of the Almighty God called a desire that He could not ignore. And it caused Him, rather than destroying them, to bring into their presence a blood sacrifice and to make atonement for their sin rather than killing them. He could have. He could have slain them and started all over again. But I I bring to you today the thought that it was God's greatest desire that caused Him not to slay them, but rather to prepare for them an alternate, an alternative where their sins could be forgiven. Oh, thank God for the blood. Thank God for a sacrifice 
for sin. Thank God that he made a way to restore communion with man once again. Man, however, did not truly repent. As you follow the story, you find that man grew increasingly wicked. And all the while, God grew increasingly more long-suffering. We read of Enoch who walked with God in the midst of an evil generation. There was some communion there between Enoch and God. In fact, it was intimate communion, if you will. They conversed each and every day. They spent time together each and every day. Enoch had this testimony that he walked with God, which means he was in constant and familiar communication with God. And ultimately, God expressed His great desire when He took Enoch out of this world. Amen. And he was not. And we finally come to the days of Noah where we see that every imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. And God did repent that he had made man. And God did decide, I'm going to destroy every living thing from off the face of the earth. But even in the midst of that decision, the eyes of the Lord continued to roam to and fro throughout the earth, looking for someone whose heart was perfect toward him. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why did Noah have a chance? Why did God extend grace to him? Because of God's greatest desire. Hallelujah. After the flood, when the earth grew wicked once again, the Bible tells us that Abram came to God's attention. A man who was raised in idolatry but who obviously had a heart for righteousness. And God chose him. God called him out. Hallelujah. God gave him promise. God said, every place you put your foot, I'm going to give that land to you. And the generations of the earth, uh, amen, will be blessed. Every nation will be blessed through you and because of you. And once again, we see an expression of God's greatest desire. But God had to continue waiting through the life of Isaac, the life of Jacob, the life of Joseph. Uh, Amen. And then 400 years of bondage in Egypt uh, because of Israel's uh, disobedience. Uh, Then 40 years of wilderness wanderings. Uh, And then 1,500 years of backslidings and rebellion and wickedness and unbelief and idolatry. And I ask you, why would God endure all of this? Why not destroy humanity and start all over again, tweaking the things that appeared to be wrong the first time around? I submit to you the reason God did not destroy humanity and start over again was because of His greatest desire. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 puts it this way. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is Thy faithfulness. Oh, I think we ought to give God praise today for His mercies that are new every morning, for His compassion, for His faithfulness, for His love. Hallelujah! For His great desire. Praise God. Praise God. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 expression of God's greatest desire 
For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Zeal means an intense enthusiasm for a cause. It was because of God's intense desire that the incarnation happened. It was because of God's intense desire that he became a man and born in a manger in Bethlehem. Jesus' birth was an expression of God's desire. So Isaiah said in 12 verse 2, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Again in chapter 62, the prophet Isaiah said, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace God speaking through him. God saying, I cannot be still. I cannot be quiet. Hallelujah. For Zion's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be turned forsaken neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate but thou shalt be called Hephzibah or the wife of the king and thy land Beulah or blessed for the Lord delighteth in thee and thy land shall be married for as a young man marrieth a virgin so shall thy sons marry thee and as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride so shall thy God rejoice over thee. God is saying, I cannot rest. I cannot be quiet until my desire comes to fruition. Hallelujah. 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 So now we see Jesus at the conclusion of His earthly ministry speaking not as a man, but as God. And saying, with desire, I have desired to eat this specific Passover with you before I suffer. You see, God had been looking toward that Passover from the very beginning of time. Even from before the foundation of the world, God had a plan. <laughs> In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, the plan. Hallelujah. It was all in God's mind in the very beginning before the foundations of the world. Hallelujah. He had been looking forward to that Passover because he knew it was that Passover that would signify the time when his desire could finally be fulfilled. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. For you see, God's greatest desire is to have communion with the human 
soul. God's greatest desire is to have communion with you. Hallelujah. When I begin to ponder and think on that, I have to ask along with the psalmist, what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visitest him? In another place he said, I am nothing. I am a worm. Why would God, the Almighty One, the One who is our Creator, the One who holds the universe in the span of His hand, the One who knows all things, the One who is all-powerful and almighty, why would He care about me? Visit me, look upon me, extend His mercy toward me. It's not because of anything I am or anything I have done except for the fact that I am His creation. Hallelujah. And His greatest desire is to have fellowship with me and fellowship with you. Hallelujah. And so he continued through 4,000 years of betrayal and 4,000 years of sin and degradation. He continued through the entire Old Testament uh, looking for that Passover when things would finally change, uh, when he would be able to fill our hearts with his spirit. Uh, and more than just law, he would write uh, his his law into our hearts. Uh, hallelujah. And we would be able to commune with Him on a level that never before had been. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. After His death and resurrection, He commissioned His disciples to go and tarry in Jerusalem until they would be endued with power from on high. Hallelujah. He said, you're going to receive the Spirit of my Father. Hallelujah. And you need to go and wait until it happens because then our communion will be sealed. Then our fellowship will be as it has never been. Hallelujah. It was so important to Jesus uh, that they wait in the upper room uh, until they were endued with power from on high. It was so important. Hallelujah. Amen. That the wind blow and the fire fall and they be filled uh, with the Holy Ghost uh, evidenced by speaking in another language that they had never learned. Uh, and it's just as important today that we come to Jesus Christ through repentance that we are buried with Him in the waters of baptism in the name of Jesus Christ and that we are filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost and speak with other tongues to commune with Him. <laughs> to have fellowship with Him. Hallelujah. God's greatest desire is communion with you. God's greatest desire is to have friendship with you. God's greatest desire is to have people dedicated to His service. God's greatest desire is to have men and women who will live for Him unapologetically, who will strive for the mastery, who will stand for righteousness, who will have the courage of righteous convictions in the face of any opposition. So the final picture that Jesus gave in the book of Revelation yes. 
to the Apostle John is found in chapter 3 and verse 20 when he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. What door? The door to the heart of humanity. The door of your soul. I stand at the door and knock. And I like what he said. If any man without qualification. Hallelujah. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Hallelujah. You see, Jesus is indiscriminate of the door. Hallelujah. He's indiscriminate of the door. Discrimination doesn't even enter in to his vocabulary. If any man, if any man will hear my voice, he will not overlook any human being who is seeking him. He desires to dwell in your heart. Across every strata of society, across every culture throughout our world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, in the eyes of God, there's only one race, and that's the human race. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Every human being bleeds red, and that's all that God cares about. And that's all that he looks at. Uh, hallelujah. If any man, if any man, if any man. Praise God. Psalm 68, verse 15 and 16. There's a passage that describes the desire of God. And it says this, the hill of God is as the hill of Bashan. If you study the Scripture, you'll find out that the hill of God is called Mount Zion. Mount Zion was just a humble hill. There was nothing significant about Mount Zion. In fact, there was a question asked in the minds of some. Why would God choose this as His mountain? <laughs> but here the psalmist is comparing the hill of God or Mount Zion with the hill of Bashan. The hill of Bashan was a high mountain. It was a beautiful mountain. It was an attention-getting mountain. It was one that when you walked by, you would stop and gaze and say, Oh, what a beautiful mountain this Mount Bashan is. But here, the psalmist is drawing a comparison. And he's saying, Mount Zion, even though it's a low mountain, even though it's a nondescript mountain, even though it's not an attractive mountain, it's just as important uh, as the hill of Bashan. It's a high hill like the hill of Bashan. Why leap ye, ye high hills? Why put yourself over and above the hill of God, ye high hills, uh, for this is the hill that God desires to dwell in. Yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. You see, it's the broken heart and the contrite spirit that captures God's attention. He's not interested in how much money you have. He's not interested in how much prestige you have. He's not interested in what your title is or what your job is or what other people think about you. All he cares about is whether or not he lives in your heart.
In fact, he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. He desires to dwell in the heart of the humble. For greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And the beautiful part of that picture is we were not even his friends. But he died for us anyway. In order to bring reconciliation through the blood, in order to bring us to a place where we could be in communion with him. The day of Pentecost was just another expression of God's greatest desire. And finally, we have a promise for the culmination. The the ultimate culmination of His desire. Jesus put it this way, let not your heart be troubled. (laughs) When you look around at all the distress in our world, when you consider all the turmoil and all the division and all the suffering and all of the attacks and all of the persecution that is surely to come, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. as they stood watching Him ascend into heaven, no doubt feeling fearful and wondering what was to become of them and what was to happen now. Amen. The Bible said God sent two men dressed in white apparel that said unto them, Why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? For this same Jesus, this same Jesus shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Why? Because that is God's greatest desire. So Paul said, wherefore comfort one another with these words. (laughs) Hallelujah. 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 If you're here this morning and you have not yet given your life to Jesus Christ, if you have not yet repented of your sins, been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and received the gift of the Holy Ghost, I came to tell you there's a God in heaven that wants nothing more and for you to come to Him today. Humble yourself before Him. Repent of your sins. Give your heart to Jesus Christ. And let Him enjoy communion with you. If you're here today and something has drawn you away, 
from close fellowship with Jesus Christ. Maybe at one time you repented and were baptized and received the Holy Ghost, but you found yourself growing a little old or lukewarm in your spirit. The Christ who died for you. God manifest in the flesh is reaching for you today. Would you come back home? Would you draw near to me? Would you find that place of fellowship with me once again? If there's somebody watching online that has grown distant and wandered away, let the Spirit of the Lord touch you today right where you are. <laughs> Let the glory of God minister to your spirit and to your soul. Because God has no greater desire. No greater desire than to commune with you.